In Revelation chapter 21, we've been shown the holy city, the new Jerusalem, the Lamb's bride. Now, in the rest of this chapter, we're going to see a fuller description in all of its glory. Today, in the Word. Good morning and welcome back to Today in the Word. Hi, I'm Glenn Schaefer. And thank you for staying with us as we are nearing the end of the book of Revelation. Today we're in the latter part of chapter 21 as we look at the details of what John describes or what he sees and was told to be the bride, the Lamb's wife, the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming right down out of heaven showing us the source from what he sees. Let's get right into the scripture beginning at verse 9. We're going to read down through the end of chapter 21. Verse 9 first. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Now, here we see a detailed description as a contrast to the harlot, the false bride that we've seen earlier as described as apostate Israel. Now, the glory of this bride. We're told in no uncertain terms that this is the bride, but they see a city. We're told it's the New Jerusalem, but he describes a city. We know it's the body of Christ, and yet he describes a city. And this is very important that we keep our feet to the fire of biblical contextual interpretation as we walk through this, or we will miss all that John is seeing. So the picture that he gives is not intending to show a city floating around in space, but rather it tells us of the divine origin from which the city comes from, from God, out of heaven. And its foundations, it has foundation and its architect and its builder is God. That sounds a whole lot like Hebrews chapter 11 when it talks about Abraham who looked for a city that was not made by man's hands, but it had foundations and the architect was God. Verse 10 of Hebrews 11 says, For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. That's what we're about to see described. What was Abraham looking for? He was looking for the church, the promise which was in Christ, the eternal promise as Paul describes it in Ephesians chapter 3. Now, because the term city is used here, people immediately began to talk about heaven. Now, I don't want to take away any glorious thoughts and visions and dreams that you have about heaven because any description that you and I might have, heaven is far beyond any of that. And God can have what he wants to have. And he can give us what he wants to give us. And heaven is great. But I want you to see the promise that the church is now presented to God now as his bride, and yes, this is the final state and the completion of all of its maturity and the work of the gospel in the nations as the kings in the nations are healed by what comes out of the city is in the city, which is the church. That is the picture of the purpose of the church in the earth now. So I don't want us to miss any of that because sometimes we get to talking about this description, and we only think about heaven. But the Bible tells us that this is the bride. The real issue here is God dwelling with man and man with God, and we are his city that is set on the hill. We are the city that Abraham was looking for. You know, when Jesus said in John 14, 1, I go to prepare a place for you. So often we get to talking about mansions. Yeah, just build me a mansion or just build me a cabin in the corner of glory land. And, you know, we talk about how God's got these great mansions for us. You know, he does. But let's not become so earthly, materialistic that we miss what John the Revelator is seeing here. In fact, when John 
records Jesus saying, do not let your hearts be troubled in John 14. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, are many apartments, are many compartments, it means in many spaces. Who is the Father's house? The writer of Hebrews says we are the Father's house. Jesus went to the cross to prepare a place. He went to the Father to prepare a place through the cross. And that's why he said, you know the way. <laughs> they said, we don't know the way. In verse 10, Jesus says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. I go to prepare a place for you in my Father's abode. That's what Jesus did to the cross. He gave us a place to dwell with God and that he would dwell with us. It's called the Father's house. That's where we are, guys. Yes, heaven is real, and it's going to be more real than I can even imagine. But I don't want you to miss the place that God has prepared for you. Now, let's keep reading here in verse 10. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It is shown with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Now, he describes here what we're seeing. He calls it the holy city, which is the heavenly Jerusalem that Paul tells us about, the writer of Hebrews tells us about. Paul says we've come to that Jerusalem, which is above. Hebrews tells us we've come to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of God. Here, the holy city is none other than that heavenly Jerusalem, and it's coming out from God, from heaven. It reveals the source from which it's coming from. It's the church purchased by God by the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's shining in all of the glory, <laughs> these precious jewels like jasper. We actually saw that reference made when John, in chapter 4 in Revelation, looked and saw the one who sat on the throne had the appearance of jasper. That's like crystal clear diamond, so to speak. In fact, it says here that it was like jasper, clear as crystal, describing the city, which is the church in all of its purity. Let's keep reading verse 12. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. And there were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now let's talk about this. This city had a great wall with 12 gates. An angel, if you remember, when Adam and Eve sinned, the angel kept them from the tree of life. We're going to see later here in the description, chapter 21, 22, of the tree of life, which is Jesus, which we now eat of and the nations will eat of. But in that day, they were pushed out of the city. Now the angels are once again guarding the gates, but these gates have the names of the 12 tribes. James refers to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. There he's calling the believers as the 12 tribes. We saw in the book of Revelation earlier of the 144,000, which taught of the first fruits, and then that number, which cannot be numbered from every tribe, every tongue, every language, was seen together. As we know, through the believing Israel, that's how the Gentiles got in. They were cut off in unbelief and grafted in through the gospel, but they were always believing Israelites, starting from Abraham, going through all the patriarchs, and even through the time that Jesus came, there was a remnant of believers, true believers, who followed after the true Messiah. And guess what? We get in through that process. They're the gates. We've become a part of the commonwealth of Israel. We have been made a part of the house. Now it's made up of both Jew and Gentile for the middle wall of division has been taken down. I keep saying that because that is the gospel revealed through the epistles. And that's what we need to see here. 
In fact, Paul references this in Romans chapter 9, I believe, when he talks about the people of Israel, verse 4 and 5. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. He's saying, is there advantage to being a Jew? Now, of course, that's a believing Jew, because all of Israel are not of Israel. We're not talking about natural descendants. We're talking about those who came from natural descendants who were true believing Jews or true believing in the Messiah. People of the Old Testament became saved or were saved just like we are, but they looked forward to the Messiah. They didn't have full understanding, but they knew there was a promise through the prophets of the coming Messiah and their faith was in the true God. Just as we look back to the true Messiah. Now John tells us these gates are literally from the east, from the north, from the south, and from the west. Now that gives a suggestion that we see both in Isaiah 49 and Luke 13. Let me read you Luke 13, verse 29. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast of the kingdom of God. Why? Because the gospel opens the door to the elect, to God who's calling them by his spirit, they come into the church, they come into this holy city, <laughs> and they're let in, and these doors are never, or these gates are never shut. So he shows us that the nations walk by the city's light. The kings of the earth will bring their wealth into her, and her gates will always be open to them. That is present time. This is not final eternity, because that will not always be the case. After the judgment seat and after the sinners and those whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life are cast in the lake of fire with the dragon, the false prophet, so forth and so on, that gate is not open from then on. This is describing the time in which the church is glorious in the earth. I believe both now, but in its latter state, definitely is what John sees. The twelve foundations are the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. These 12 apostles are listed as the foundation of the city. Now, that's terminology of the church. And, of course, this is straight out of Paul's teaching in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, so then, this is verse 19 through 22, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. Talking about us, who are Gentiles, we are grafted in, made apart, came through those gates, named after those 12 tribes. Are you getting that? And we come in through that. The nations of the earth come in. So he says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. <laughs> he made a place for us in the Father's house, God's household, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, though I believe an apostolic prophetic ministry exists today, in the context of what Paul is writing, he's saying that the New Testament apostles and the Old Testament prophets form the foundation of Christ, the cornerstone. So the New Testament apostles like Peter, who stood up and quoted the Old Testament prophet like Joel that said, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel on the day of Pentecost, or any time the apostles give understanding of the Old Testament prophets, that's what Jesus reveals of the Old Testament, gives us understanding. The foundation is built upon, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, all pointing to Jesus, describing Jesus, the Messiah, and he's the chief cornerstone. Now, keep reading here, it says, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple, <laughs> In the Lord, in whom you are being built together, talking about Jew and Gentile, into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Now, this is what John sees, this holy city, these 12 gates from the north, south, east, and west, open, guarded by the angels as the nations of the earth come in. Let's keep reading. Verse 15, the angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls, and the city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city and with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length 
and as wide and as high as it is long. And the angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. Now, just as the temple was measured in chapter 11, you might remember, to show that it was being protected and it showed ownership by God. Now, this demonstrates that the city is square, is wide, and here's what it says. He measured the city with a reed, and its length and width and height was square. It is like the holies of holies. You might remember the tabernacle in the wilderness and now the temple that was built. It had the outer court and then it had the holy place and holies of holies, which was like a rectangle. But when you came to the holies of holies, it was a square, just what's described here. When Jesus died on the cross, he rent the veil from top to bottom of that holies of holies that we could come in. We can come boldly before the throne of grace. That's where we live. That's where God dwells with us. Now God's dwelling is with his people and his people's with them. And that's the city of God. That's the dwelling place. Ooh, I get excited seeing what we're described. It's the holies of holies. It's a divine model of the whole city. Wow. The city is perfect squared. The new Jerusalem in itself. David Children calls it, the new Jerusalem is itself a cosmic holy of holies. <laughs> now, dispensationalism tries very hard to use literalism here, and it's almost embarrassing when you really begin to think about what's being tried try to be done. You see models online of what this square city would be like. Now, that's, it's approximately 1,400 to 1,500 miles high, 1,400 miles wide, 1,400 miles deep. In other words, it's a cube of 1,400. If you were to put it on the map of the United States, it would cover half of the United States from like Nebraska all the way over to the East Coast and from Canada down to Texas and Florida. I mean, it would cover a big portion if you're just looking at that measurements with a wall of about 216 feet thick. So this 12,000 stadia or 1,400 miles it's really, if you put it on the world in which John would have been writing, it would have covered the entire then known world, from Egypt over to Persia, uh, from Asia Minor uh, down. It would have been that square it would have covered. In other words, it is the gospel going out to the known world. Now, if you try to make this literal, then you've got a city that's going up 15 hundred miles. Now dispensationalists actually teach that this city comes down and hovers over the earth. I'm kind of getting sidetracked here, but I got to tell you. Over the earth during the millennium while Jesus is sitting on the throne on the earth and the converted Jews come from all over the earth once a year and offer blood sacrifices. And dispensation says this is done as a memorial even though Jesus died once and for all to bring an end to the sacrifice of blood and bulls, the dispensationalists say that they'll be traveling. Believers who made it through the tribulation will come and offer blood sacrifices, bulls of goats and turtle doves and sacrifices while Jesus sits on the throne in Jerusalem and the city hovers over the earth because the Jews have to be separate from the Christians, because we're the holy city, we live in heaven, those speak what well, they say, the holy city. No, no, no. We are the holy city, made up of Jews and Gentiles. We're the holy dwelling place of God. Sorry about the little distraction, but it, I want you to see the biblical context of what John is seeing and not what we project so many times into these descriptions. This was the city that Abraham was looking for. This is a city called the New Jerusalem. So let's keep looking at it as we go through this in, in, in this description. Now it says, The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth tobacco, Topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, 
each gate made of a single pearl, and the great city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. The wall made of jasper in the city of pure gold, it describes what? The description of holiness and righteousness. The street of pure gold, the way of righteousness and holiness. The 12 foundations of the city were adorned with every kind of precious stone, just like the high priest's breastplate was, which has four rows of three gems, each representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Here the foundations of the church are named after the apostles. It also is decorated with precious gems as a bride adorned for her husband. Just like Solomon's temple's foundation was laid with precious stones, here the city, the precious city, the church of Jesus Christ, are made beautiful because that's what it is. Now, about eight centuries before John saw this, Isaiah the prophet sees and describes and prophesies in Isaiah 54 something similar about how God makes this city beautiful. O afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, behold, I will set stones in fair colors and your foundations I will lay in sapphires. Moreover, I will make your battlements of rubies and your gates of sparkling jewels and your entire wall of precious stones. He's talking to Israel of what salvation would look like when it came, and John is describing the same salvation. Now let's read verse 22. It says, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. And the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. What a beautiful description. We are now walking in the light. Jesus is the light that came. He delivered us out of the kingdom of darkness and translated us over in the kingdom of his dear son. We've been brought out of the kingdom of darkness into light. We live where God is the light. The lamb is the light. The city, God's people have no need of any other kind of splendor because God's glory gives it the light. The Lamb, Jesus Christ himself, is the light. You remember over in Isaiah 60 where he says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. He's prophesying Jesus. Your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you. Talking about the day that Christ would come and change the world from darkness to light for those who entered in to the kingdom of God. I love it when I see the fulfillment of what is described. This is what Jesus commanded his church to be. What? A city that is set on the hill. A light to the world, shining before all of men. So obviously the new Jerusalem cannot be seen simply in terms of some eternal future abode. Yes, it is the final state and the fullness of it, but it's also now as we walk in the light and the nations are converted and flowing into the city, as it's described, through the gospel. Let's re read the last part of the chapter. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there, and the glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or is deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You can't get into the city without being born again, without being declared righteous, holy. It doesn't mean that you never sin, but we're declared sinless, declared pure. He presents the church to himself as bright and beautiful without spot or wrinkle. What we see is as the light of the gospel shines through the church to the world, the world and the nations are discipled and converted, and the wealth of the sinners becomes inheritance for the just. That means that we see the gospel victorious. That's the basic promise of what the scriptures teach us. It's the pattern we see in history, how that little stone becomes a huge mountain and fills all the earth. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. It guarantees the fulfillment of all of his prophecies that he certainly sets on the throne and makes all 
things new. I love the book of Revelation. Thank you for joining me today in the Word.